Hallelujah. God bless you. Welcome to our Wednesday midweek service. For those of you that are just now tuning in, uh, we're about to start our evening class. Uh, we just went through our worship, our announcements. We wished our sister, uh, Leanne Simon, a, a, a wonderful, peaceful, blessed farewell. Uh, she's leaving uh, New York, but not sole purpose, and we just want to send her off with blessing. We've done so. Uh, we want to welcome you guys now for tuning in. Uh, this evening, we have our guest speaker, Brother Alan Weir, who I'm going to have come up, and he's going to be sharing uh, from Second Peter this evening. Hallelujah. Come on up, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. I, don't want I really don't want them to leave. So let's, uh, Let me fix this. Um, yeah. I, although I probably don't need to even need the mic. Yeah, you do. Um, the camera needs it. Again, I'll make this short and sweet. Um, when I, we, my wife and I first started coming to Soul Purpose, uh, we debated about whether or not to come to a Sunday service or to a Bible study. My wife wanted to come to a Sunday service, and I said, you know what? Churches are full on Sunday mornings. Anyone can go to church on Sunday morning. But you gauge a church's doctrine and teaching by Bible study. Yes. That's how you know what a church teaches, what their doctrine is, whether their pastor preaches and teaches the uncompromising word of God. And I can proudly say, without pride, of course, I can proudly say that our pastor preaches and teaches the uncompromising word of God. Amen. All right, Amen. there's no sugarcoating. Some people may come, get offended. They may leave. That's okay. Even Jesus had people yes. walk away from him. Mm -hmm. And at one point, there were only 12 Christians in the entire world, and one of them fell away. All right? That being said, um, earlier in the year, we uh, did a Bible study on 1 Peter. And, uh, and now we're going to continue uh, with the book of 2 Peter, the epistle of 2 Peter. Now, uh, before we get into um, 2 Peter, I think it's... Uh, most appropriate that we uh, set the tone for what we're going to hear tonight. Um, Peter was uh, was spreading the gospel and teaching, and uh, one of the challenges he faced was that there was a lot of persecution going on. Um, a lot of it was within the church itself, and so what Peter did was he wrote his first letter to believers at that time. Um, Stephen had been martyred. He had been killed for his faith. And the believers got scared, and they all scattered through five provinces or five districts in the Roman Empire. And they all scattered in different directions. And they, they went to different parts of the Roman Empire. And there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of believers were getting discouraged. They didn't want to continue in the faith. Others wanted to remain believers on the down low. You know, they didn't want to, let's, let's stay Christians, but if being a believer is going to get us persecuted, we're going to lose our jobs, lose our livelihood, let's stay believers, but we don't have to, we don't have to uh, advertise it. And every year, every Roman citizen, every subject of the empire was required to go into the Roman temple with a pinch of incense. And all you had to do to be left alone is toss that pinch of incense into a fire and say, Caesar is Lord. And a lot of believers were saying, well, what's the big deal? It's only once a year. Let's just do it, and then everybody will get off our case. But you know as well as I do that a little bit of compromise leads to a lot of compromise. And believers, I mean, they, could, they couldn't do that. So uh, other believers were being blackmailed, and uh, they, got, they got discouraged. They were paid by the Roman authorities to hand over their fellow believers uh, they infiltrated the church through false doctrine. They infiltrated the church. Uh, some of them even sent um, uh, gossipers into the church to cause division. Mm -hmm. And that happened as well. Uh, it came to the point where, uh, you know, when you met somebody on the street and you thought they were a Christian, you would never ask them, hey, are you a follower of Jesus Christ or are you a Christian? There was a code word that was used. Mm -hmm. Who remembers what that code word was? Mm -hmm. Are you a follower of the way? And, of course, the Romans were very good at building roads, and the roads were called ways. And so you would go up to someone and say, hey, are you a follower of the way? And nobody would know what that meant. Well, the Romans got wind of that, and they sent people into the church to pretend they were Christians, to learn the evangelical lingo. And then they got wise to that. Christians were meeting in cemeteries. They were meeting in sewers. 
They were meeting in, uh, in, in small graveyards in the woods because they couldn't meet in people's homes. If you met in someone's home, your door would get kicked in, you get arrested. Some of your worst enemies were the members of your own body of believers. Others were from your own family. So he writes his first letter, and he, he waits for a response. Now, at that time, of course, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. So, and uh, the Romans had their own postal service. The Imperial Postal Service is what it was called. Only official correspondence would go through that. There was no way the Romans were going to send, were going to take a letter from an apostle, from a, a Christian, and deliver it. And so you would, had to, you would have to hand the letter over to someone that you trusted. You assumed that letter would get to its destination. A name, believer named Silvanus, and he gives Silvanus a letter. That's his first letter to the believers, and the letter gets sent through the five provinces of the Roman Empire. It gets circulated, and then Peter waits for a response. Eventually, he gets arrested, and he gets sent to Mamertine Prison in Rome. Now, Mamertine Prison, for lack of a better term, was the Rikers Island of the Roman Empire. You awaited. You never did time in San Martin. You waited. Some of them were sent on galleys. Everybody remembers Ben-Hur, you know, yeah. rowing the boat. Other people were sent to mines to work the mines. But you never, never uh, were sentenced to Mamertine. Unless you were in Mamertine rotting in a cell, waiting for your trial, they would forget about you. That would be the end of you because no one would ever hear from you again. That being said, uh, Peter gets arrested and he's sitting in um, Mamertine. He doesn't hear anything. He may be getting discouraged. All of a sudden, he gets a visitor. It's Sylvanus. He shows up, worn, tired, wearied, and he visits Peter in the Mamertine prison, and he uh, tells Peter, letter got delivered, the believers are strengthened, and Peter is a little in, is somewhat encouraged, but then Sylvanus tells him, well, there's, there's a problem, though. Peter asks, what's the problem? And he tells them, although the believers were strengthened by your letter, there's a lot of false doctrine and false teachers that are going around. They're taking advantage of the fact that you're here in prison. And what they're saying about you, Peter, is that they're, they're discrediting you. They're saying you're a false teacher. They're saying that you um, are spreading false doctrine. And they're also saying that um, you're doing what you're doing, and so are the other apostles, for financial gain and for popularity. And Peter says, well, what are you talking about? I'm sitting in a Roman cell waiting for my execution. Why would I be doing this for profit or popularity? And so he writes a second letter and gives it to Silvanus. It would be the last time anybody lays eyes on Peter. Silvanus leaves, and Peter says goodbye to Silvanus, knowing he's about to be executed. And so Silvanus leaves and goes to deliver that letter. And that letter is the second epistle of Peter. In order to get, there's a fly flying around me. In order to get, uh, get an idea of um, what was going on, where was Peter, what it was like, we have a video. Can we turn off number one? Um, this is the video, and what you're about to see is the actual cell where Peter was held in Mamertine Prison.
So I never like to do a Bible study about a particular book of the Bible. I, what, I, what I always like to do is I like to take people back in time. You should see um, what, where Peter was writing from, and that was the actual cell. Uh, many, many times, um, the top part was where you would enter. They would lower you through a manhole like you saw, and they would lower you into your cell. You defecated and urinated in your same cell. Food was lowered to you when they would feed you. You were many times dependent on visitors, which was extremely rare. Visiting someone in a Roman prison was very risky. Sometimes you yourself would be held if the guards wanted to take advantage of you. If they really didn't like you, they would uh, put a dead animal or a corpse in the cell with you, a rotting corpse, to make your experience even more miserable. It's cold, it's damp, it's wet, it smells, you're hungry, you're lonely. And even though Peter was going through all that, he wrote a letter encouraging believers to persevere. But now he faces an even greater challenge. People are just, he's sitting in a cell for the faith and people, false teachers, doctrines of devils are discrediting him. So we're going to get into 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to ask our sister Kiara Roman to come up and read 2 Peter chapter 1. The second letter of Peter written to the persecuted believers who were scattered throughout the five provinces of the Roman Empire, chapter 1. Okay. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you, you may be partakers of the, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, not, you will neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more vigilant to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we were made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his, of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son, in him who I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit.
Okay. We're going to be, uh, I think everybody here has a handout. If not, just, um, you have, a, you have handouts? Okay. We're going to be dividing chapter one of Second Peter into five sections. Um, the first section is greetings and credentials. That's verses one through two. The second part is power for faithful living, verses three through four. The third part is progress in faithful living. That's verses five through nine. Part four is admonition to faithful living. That's verses 10 through 15. And the last one is section five, the prophetic word to faithful living, verses 16 through 21. Now, before we get started, um, the Greeks um, and the New Testament, uh, I mean, they, they had a habit of run-on sentences. Sometimes a verse would go on and on and on uh, for like five verses. One sentence would be an entire paragraph long. That's just the way they wrote. Okay, so uh, it can be a little confusing sometimes. So we're going to go through this entire chapter, and some of these sections stop in the middle of, of, a, of a, a sentence. So uh, a, a long sentence can div be divided into three verses. But that's, again, that's just the way they wrote back in those days. Okay, so let's unpack this. Now, the first thing we see is the greetings and credentials, verses 1 through 2. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And there goes that run on after verse 3. Now, first thing, let's unpack this. Why does he use the word Simon Peter? That's obviously not his first and last name. There's a lot of division in the church back then. Jews and Gentiles, Jewish believers and, and Gentile believers, there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of division, okay? So what Peter does, I mean, this is his last letter. It's do or die. So what he tries to do is he tries to do the best he can to address both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Most of them are Greek. So he relates to both by using Jewish and Greek names. Now, Simon is, of course, Hebrew, and Peter is Greek. So many people in the Greek world would use their given name, and then they would use the, the language of wherever they were. Back then, the way English is a common language in the world today, back then Greek was the common language. It was referred to as something called lingua franca, the common language. Everyone, everybody speaks Greek. If you were in school, got to speak Greek. The same way what's usually taught in schools today, Spanish and English, right? Back then it was Greek. Got to learn Greek. Everyone has to. More people spoke Greek than they did Latin in Rome, so that was what. That's the reason why he uses the word Simon Peter. He's trying to relate to both Jewish and Gentile Greek believers. All right. Now he uses a very special term. He uses the word bond servant. Now in Greek the word is doulos, and that means in Greek to bind. Now, a lot of folks uh, believe, of course, that this refers to a common slave who's bought and who is serving their master in slavery, against their will. However, it's, it's used in a different sense. In this particular verse, um, Peter uses the word doulos, meaning bondservant. He uses it in the Hebrew sense. He changes it. Doulos in the Hebrew sense is somebody, is a slave, who's free, but willingly commits himself. I want to, I'm free, but I want to stay with my master because I love my master, I respect my master, and I'm choosing to be in his service. And once you committed yourself to be with your master willingly, that's it for life. Okay? And that's the way you and I are believers, of course. We are willingly committing ourselves. We are all douloses. Okay? We've been bought with a price. We're free to choose, and we've all chosen to serve our Lord willingly out of our love for him. Amen? Now, he also mentions his credentials. Again, this is the greetings and credentials. He mentions that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, that word apostle, we hear it a lot these days. A lot of preachers refer to themselves as apostles. We all hear it all the time. Uh, the word apostle is not a Christian term. It's a, it's a secular Greek term. And an apostle basically means uh, to be from and sent forth. Now, he uses the word apostle to convey the idea that he's a trustworthy messenger, he has the credentials to speak the gospel. Now, back then, the word apostle was used in different ways. Um, an apostle is somebody who is sent by another person. It's always somebody of a higher rank. 
someone of an equal rank doesn't is not an apostle. So if I send, if a pastor sends uh, 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 someone on a mission, or if a king sends someone on a mission, the person who sends you is always of a higher rank. All right? So then you're an apostle. Uh, ambassadors were referred to in Greek as apostolos. You spoke on behalf of your government. You didn't represent yourself, and you only said what you were told to say. You represented your, your, your government's point of view. We are all apostolos in that respect. Yes. Okay? Um, a cargo ship. If a ship carried a very precious shipment, if you were a king and you sent a ship on a special mission with a very precious cargo, that ship would be referred to as apostolic. It's special. It's carrying something very special. And what are we all carrying? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And what are we all delivering? The, word. the message, the word. We are all cargoes. We are all apostolic. Yay. All right? An admiral of a fleet. Uh, I'm a king, and I send you on a special mission. And the special mission is whatever it may be. Uh, because I'm sending you on a special mission, you are apostolic. All right? You're sent for a special purpose. All right. Uh, he also uses the term to those who have obtained like precious faith. Now we're going to combine these uh, these things together. That word obtained usually on the, in a regular Greek dictionary, when you see the word obtained, it means to get. Not in Greek. A lot of words are different. If you're ever studying the Bible, you should always have a regular dictionary. But in Greek, the words are very very different. That word obtained just doesn't mean to get. It means that when you obtain something by the grace of somebody else. It's something, when you obtain something, Lanchano, you're getting something that you have no business receiving. You don't deserve it, you have no business getting it, it's given to you by grace, it's Lanchano. You've obtained, um, it says here, you've obtained like precious faith. Now we all know what it means if I say we're all like-minded, right? Or we think alike. That means we're of the same frame of mind. And what he says, see, that Greek word is isotimin. It means of equal value. Again, there was a lot of division among the Jewish and Greek believers. And what Peter's trying to convey is the idea that one Christian is not better than the other. All right? You all have equal standing. You all have the same faith. Anyone who places their trust in Christ has access to God the Father and can be saved. In fact, that word isotimin was used in the ancient world if you visited a foreign country and you were given the same rights and same privileges as the citizens that were there, you were isotomen. You were given the same privileges. And no believer is worth more or more special than another. And that's what Peter's trying to convey. No division between you guys. Jewish and Greek believers, you're all the same. You're all saved by grace. One is not more special than the other. And this was against the false teachers who were teaching false doctrine. The false teachers were teaching that salvation is a very special thing that can only, and the knowledge of salvation, only a few can get it. And Peter tries to tear this down. No, it's not anything unique or special. Anyone can be saved if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. One believer is not worth more than the other. And let's jump also to now, here we go. Grace and peace. Now, of course, I, pastor's laughing at that, Okay. Uh, I, I, I used to always joke around. I really, really, when I came to the soul, soul purpose, I, I said rice and beans. Remember that? Like, rice and beans, what are they saying? Grace and peace. I thought it was, I thought it was cheesy, and I said, I'm not saying that. You think grace and peace. Uh, actually, grace and peace is not a greeting. It's a prayer. In Greek, it is a prayer. Uh, Peter combined, remember he's talking to Jewish and Greek believers. He combines the Greek and Hebrew greeting. Um, grace and peace. Grace is charis and peace is shalom. So I look at you and I say, charis shalom, grace and peace to you. Yeah. And he's trying to relate to Gentile and Jewish believers. Now he also says he wants this grace to be multiplied. And he wants it multiplied um, in abundance through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now what does that mean to be multiplied? It, um, basically, uh, when he's wishing grace and peace be multiplied, he's asking that it, it increase in amount, that it's continuous. Okay, he wants the grace and peace to continuously increase more and more. Thank you, Lord. Now, in the Greek, grace and peace, as it's used in this verse, there are two grammatical tenses that are used. Number one, it's in the optive mood, which means it's something that you want to happen in the strongest possible terms. 
you want grace and peace to be given to Alex in the strongest possible term. But it's also in the passive voice in Greek, which means it comes from an outside source. So when I say grace and peace to Alex instead of rice and beans, when I say grace and peace, it's a prayer. I'm, wish, I'm wishing him harish shalom. And I want it to be his in the strongest possible sense. And I want it to continuously grow every single day. It's a prayer. Grace and peace is a prayer. Now he wants this, a grace and peace, to be multiplied through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of Greek words have more than one definition. In Greek, there are two Greek words for knowledge. There is gnosis and epignosis. And when you go to a doctor, a doctor gives you a prognosis, which means he takes a look at you and says, I think this is what's wrong, but we're going to have to do more tests. He's taking an educated guess based on his expertise. Gnosis is just informational knowledge. It can come through study. It can come through obtaining information. That's gnosis. Epignosis is knowledge that's based on relationship. It's deeper. It comes from knowing someone personally and intimately. And what Peter was saying, that grace and peace are blessings that can only be obtained by what? Having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That anyone can have grace and peace. If you want to have grace and peace, you just can't have gnosis. A lot of people know about Christ. They have the gnosis. If you want grace and peace, you have to have the epignosis. You have to have the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, let's, talk, let's jump to uh, part two. Power for faithful living. That's verses three through four. All right, I'm going to read this here. And again, it runs on in the middle of the sentence. Uh, As his divine power has given us given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There it is, that run-on sentence again. Now, he uses two phrases that are key to success in the Christian life. He uses divine power and divine nature. Now, divine power in Greek is theos dunamis. And divine nature is theos fusis. Now, these are unique expressions in the New Testament. They're not used any place else except in the book of 2 Peter. And what Peter is trying to communicate is that divine power is the power of God that was used in raising Christ from the dead. And that same power is available to us as believers in our everyday lives. All right? The divine nature is everything that makes up God. Now, what are God's characteristics? Holiness, love, grace, righteousness. Now, remember, Scripture, when you're interpreting Scripture, one thing always leads to another. It's kind of like dominoes. One hits the other, and the other one falls down. And Scripture is a unity. The divine power of God gives you the divine nature. The theos dunamis gives you the theos fusis. If you want to have a divine nature, you have to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And his divine power will give you the divine nature. And that divine nature is a transforming effect in every believer. Amen? Yes, amen. Okay. Um, he uses that term that the divine, everything has been given. Now that word has been given is deuteronomy. Deuteritai, I'm sorry. It means uh, to bestow upon. Now this isn't, of course, when we see that phrase, has been given of course, ordinarily you think it means, well, he, he gave something to us. But in the Greek, um, it conveys the idea that what's being given is something extremely special. In Mark 15, 45, the word was used when Pilate gave Jesus' body to Joseph Arimathea. Christ's body was precious. It was the Torah tie. It wasn't just anybody's body that was being given. And of course, people were, were crucified in bunches in those days. I mean, it was like a mass execution. So uh, that day, there were three people who were being executed. Maybe the day before, there were 10. But this wasn't just any, but anybody. This wasn't just any corpse. It was the corpse of our Lord and Savior. It was their tie, something very special. Great and precious promises in verse 4. Now, the word for great and precious promises is epangelo. Epang is where we get the word angels from. An angel is a messenger. And these great and precious promises are, uh, in the Greek, epangelo means a public announcement. 
These great and precious promises are public announcements. They're in the word of God. We're blessed with great and precious promises. What are some of these promises that God has given us? Salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. These are all, all these things are epangelo. They're great and precious promises that the Lord has given us. I know I'm going quickly, but I'm trying to cover as much material as possible. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, we can go over them after the study is over. Let me have you fall. Is this going to fall? I got it. There it is right there. Okay. Hopefully it won't fall. It is going to fall. There you go. Very good. I can always be like a televangelist, right? I can hold it in my hand, right? Okay. Okay, number three, progress in faith for living, verses five through nine. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I'm going to stop there because we're going to, thank you, Pastor. We're going to get into um, this whole section, verses 5 through 9. Now, in this section, Peter's describing the responsibility we have to progress in our walk with the Lord. Okay, and he lists seven characteristics. Now, it's no coincidence that he uses the word, the number seven. Now, what's seven symbolic of in Scripture? Completion, perfection, all right? What Peter is saying, basically, in a way, is he's saying, hey, if you want to be a well-rounded Christian, these are seven characteristics that you should have. Amen. Now, in verse 5, he says, but for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, that word add. Look at a regular dictionary, and the word add means to supplement, to combine. Not in Greek. Not in Greek. Greek, uh, Greek, is, Greek is a picture language. Remember we said that before? A lot of words are connected with pictures. The word add is epikoriogo. It's where we get the word choreographer or chorus. Our church has a chorus. And who is our choreographer? Our sister India. Okay? She's our chorea guy. A chorea guy in Greek, okay? Now, in ancient Greece, the state government would form the chorus, and then he would hire a director, a chorea guy. And the chorea guy was responsible for protecting the chorus, hiring bodyguards, providing for every need, food and clothing, and for training them. The chorea guy was responsible for everything. Who is our chorea guy? That's right, he's our chorea guy. And so the word came to mean the idea of generous provision. In the same way, uh, this word came to mean generous provision. And also where we get the word chorus from. Now, this is a play on words. A lot of Greek words are a play on words. The word ad is Greek for uh, chorus and choreographer. And what Peter is implying is that these seven characteristics that believers are supposed to have are like a symphony. They're a chorus that's beautiful to the Lord. That's why he uses the word ad, chorea guy, all right? Um, it conveys the idea of generous provision. The same way this Greek verb meant to richly supply everything that an ancient chorus needs, so it'll be a grand production. Our lives as believers, in a sense, are to be a grand production for the Lord. Amen. And our chorea guy, our Lord, is the one who provides all our needs, protects us, washes over us, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, trains us in godly living. He's our courtier guy. Now we get into seven characteristics, seven uh, uh, traits that Peter is mentioning. Let's unpack these real quickly. Verse 5, he mentions the word virtue, which is arete. It means moral excellence. In Greek, this came to mean a soldier, a soldier who had extraordinary courage and was like, like Rambo. Rambo had arete. Anybody, yeah. anybody who knows who Rambo is, right? Yeah. Not before, okay. Arete. It meant, uh, it meant a quality about a particular person that stands out among the rest. And you and I, as believers, are supposed to have arete. We're supposed to stand out at our jobs, in our communities, among our family members. We're all supposed to have arete. There was a, um, a long-distance runner in the uh, early 1920s. His name was Pavon Nermi. And this guy won, like, tons of gold medals. He was a long-distance runner, and he could run really fast. But, you know, a lot of guys could run fast, but this guy was different um, in the way he used to train. He used to train with a stopwatch in his hand, always gauging and measuring his progress, how well he was doing. I really believe Peter would have appreciated this guy for the way he trained. 
you and I, in a sense, are supposed to have aretev. We're supposed to keep a spiritual stopwatch in our hands and always gauge our progress in our Christian walk with the Lord. That's what's implied here. Um, so that's the first uh, characteristic, aretev. All right, moral excellence. Um, it also came to mean soil, soil that was very rich, where crops could grow, was called elete, because it was productive, it was useful. It had it, it, soil that stood out among every other soil was arete. It stood out, it was great, it was fantastic. Everybody was jealous of you if you had soil that was arete. The second characteristic is knowledge. Now remember in the previous verse, we use the word epignosis for intimate knowledge and relationship. Here, Peter flips it, and he uses the other word for knowledge, gnosis. And what this particular word means is understanding, knowledge of truth, studying. What Peter is saying is study to show thyself approved. Okay? He not only wants you to have a personal relationship with Christ, but once you have this relationship, study, get to know Christ. Read the word, understand the word, apply it to your life, interpret it properly. You're supposed to have epignosis. Some people have the gnosis without the epignosis. A lot of people study the Bible and read the Bible but don't have a walk with the Lord. You must have both. That's right. Amen. But before you have the gnosis, you have to have the epignosis. You have to have a close relationship with Christ. And once you have that, study the word of God. Come to Bible study. Amen. Develop a habit of studying the scripture. Get the gnosis once you have the epignosis. Amen. Here's another trait that he mentions. Uh, Self-control. Ekratia. Uh, that means to grab yourself. Now, we all heard the phrase, get a hold of yourself, right? Yeah. That's what this word means. Get a hold of yourself. Be disciplined. All right? There was a Greek trainer named Philostratos. And this particular trainer, back in the early days of Greece, uh, he, he was very picky about who he trained. Okay, and many times mothers would bring their sons to him because the, they figured, well, you know, who's going to turn down mom, right? So mothers would bring their sons to be trained by this trainer so they could be in the Olympics. And the first thing he would ask these young men is, do you partake in worldly pleasures? Do you drink? And are you a glutton? And he would look at them to see if they were overweight. He would look at their faces to see if they drank. And if he got the impression that they were drinkers, that they were overweight, that they, uh, their eyes looked like they were tired, that means they were staying up late, he would not train them. He would not train them. They didn't have enkatia. He wanted them to have self-control. Get a hold of yourself, control your passions, but this is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You cannot control yourself. So self-control is not really self-control. It's basically surrendering to the Holy Spirit so Amen. he can restrain your passions and you can live a godly life Amen. all right let's move on here now we have here the word perseverance it mentions here the other characteristic is perseverance hypomenon now a lot of people believe of course the regular dictionary says that perseverance means to continue despite obstacles not in greek okay the, the word perseverance is hypomenon it means to submit yourself when you don't want to submit yourself. It means to keep going when you don't want to keep going. Now remember, Greek is a picture word. Uh, hypomen also came to mean looking forward and beyond what you're going through at the immediate moment. Now Greek, Greek being a picture word, there are three things, three pictures in Greek that this communicated. Someone who is experiencing grief but continues has hypomenon, perseverance. Hypomenon also came to mean uh, a, a picture of a soldier. You're a soldier and you're surrounded by the enemy. They tell you to surrender. You keep fighting. You have hypomenon, okay? A plant that continues to thrive and grow, even though the soil is lousy, the sun's beating down on it, there's no water, but the plant continues to grow and to thrive. That flower or plant has hypomenon. It's staying power, all right? And uh, what Peter was communicating is that you and I in these last days need hypomenon. Okay, we need to be able to persevere through our difficulties. We need to have discernment against false teaching. 
uh, hypomanent is not just going through difficult times. When someone's trying to lure you away through false doctrine or teach you something that's an error, you have to, you have, to have gnosis and you have to have hypomanent to back up that gnosis. You have to have staying power and perseverance to continue in the faith. Here's another characteristic, godliness. And this was a secular Greek word that was used by uh, philosophers and Greek people who always stayed in contact with the gods. They were always hanging out in the temple and sacrificing. But Peter uses the Greek word, and he sort of uses it in a Christian sense. He's kind of using it against the secularists and saying, you have to have Eusebian, stay in close contact with the Lord through prayer and through fellowship. We're all to have Eusebian, godliness, stay in contact and have close communion with our Lord. So we're all called to have that. Now, these first five traits deal with our relationship to God. The last two are combined into one word. They have to do with our relationship to others. Brotherly kindness and love. And the Greek word is Philadelphian. All right? Now, that isn't an emotion. In Greek, it's not an emotion. It's an action. It means continuing to do good, continuing to show grace, forgiving when you don't want to forgive, showing love when you don't want to show love. Okay? Now, in verse 8, we go down to verse 8. For, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. Now, he uses two words here, barren and unfruitful. Now, the word barren in Greek is argos. That was the word that was used to describe someone who shows up for work and doesn't do anything. You just show up. How many churches have people that have argos. They come to church. Pastor said it many times. You come to church, you sit down, you don't worship, you don't pray, you don't read your Bible, you don't offer to help, you just sit there. You're warming a pew. That is argos. Your life is barren. You're useless. God, God can't use you because you don't want to be used. The result of being barren and not doing anything for God is unfruitful. And that word came to mean, uh, it means uh, not being uh, totally unprofitable. Archipos pictures a tree without fruit. And in this sense, a person who's archipos is a tree that even in good soil with a lot of water, you're still not bearing fruit. Now, we've all heard the story of the cursing of the fig tree in the Gospels, right? Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? That's right. Now, in the Middle East... The fig tree is the only tree where leaves and fruit appear at the exact same time. Every other tree, leaves show up first, fruit appears later on. But not the fig tree. If you approach a fig tree and it has leaves, it's natural to expect to see fruit. So when Jesus approached a fig tree and he saw leaves on it and it didn't have any fruit, he cursed it as an illustration of having appearance without substance. Hypocrisy. And that's the reason why he cursed the fig tree. We're called uh, not to be archipos. We're called to be useful for the Lord. And if we're useful, we'll bear fruit. Amen. All right. Now, verse 9, it mentions being short-sighted and blind. Now, one leads to the other. Some people are short-sighted. Other people are blind. Now, being short-sighted literally is a person who can only see a certain distance. When you're driving in a fog and you turn on your lights... You can only see a certain distance in front of you. You're short-sighted. You can't see long distance. That's what that word means in the Greek. It means someone who cannot see far ahead of themselves. And he doesn't want believers to be short-sighted. What he wants is believers to look beyond what they're going through in the immediate and look at the eternal. And I, even I myself am guilty of that. I go through a hard time, and I'm not thinking of that, the greater realities of heaven. I'm only thinking about what I'm going through at that moment. Short-sightedness. Now, eventually, if you continue to be short-sighted, what's going to happen to you? You're going to end up being blind, okay? And he mentions that this blindness also is the result of, again, you're refusing to see things in the eternal light, all right? And that Greek word for blindness is tuflos. Basically, in the, English, in the Greek, it means that you're in a fire and there's smoke right in front of you, and the smoke is obstructing your vision, all right? Uh, figuratively, the, the word two plus pictures one's mind as blind, you're ignorant, you're slow of understanding, and you're self-deceived. Remember, all these terms are terms that Peter's using because of the false teaching 
of the false teachers who are spreading lies, all right? Verse 4, admonition to faithful living, verses 10 through 15. Let's get into that. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Now, he uses the word diligent. Of course, that word in the Greek is spudacity. It means intensity of purpose. He wants us to be, he wanted the believers to have to be intense about their desire to follow Christ. Now, that word calling, uh, be diligent about your calling. In the Greek, that word was used when I invited you to a banquet. If I invited you to a grand banquet, I was the word was klesen. And so what would happen is if I'm throwing a party or a banquet, I would go out into the street and I would yell out the word klesen. I'm inviting people to a banquet, a grand production, a grand banquet. And of course, the hope is that people would come. All right. So it was also used in terms of, you know, getting drafted. Okay. You would, uh, there was a war and the government would issue a klesen, a call for volunteers to fight. And you and I are being called to fight for the gospel and fight for our Lord, all right? Uh, he wants our calling to be sure. And now uh, this word for sure is bebion. Now, we all have cars here. Most of us have cars, and there's a title to the car. If somebody accuses you of driving a stolen car, all you've got to do is show your ID and take out the title. And that title proves that you own the car. In this verse, Peter is saying that we need to make our calling sure, bebion. We need to be sure that we are saved. Now, what is the seal? What has the Lord given us that seals us, that says that we're saved? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our bebion. The Holy Spirit is what seals us. The Holy Spirit is God's title. So, you know, I'm not saying that God's going to get pulled over, but, but, it, but, it, but basically, the Holy Spirit is the title that says that the Lord owns you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, he uses the word stumble, so that if you have these characteristics, you will not stumble. And this is basically to go in reverse. It was used of soldiers who are retreating in battle because they don't want to fight anymore, they have battle fatigue, or they're cowards. And the Lord doesn't want us to uh, have, I think the word here is, uh, yes, actually, it's petesei, petesete, to stumble, to experience a reversal, to retreat or to turn back. Maybe through cowardness, or you don't want to fight anymore, or, or you're, uh, you're a uh, traitor. Of course, you know, the enemy is telling you don't fight, and so you would petesete, you would stumble, you would go in reverse and turn against your own troops, all right? He uses the word uh, in verse 11. We see here, uh, if I can go back to it real quickly, um, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter distinguishes between a just barely made it into heaven with an abundant welcome. Now, when Stephen was martyred in the book of Acts, I believe it was chapter 7, as he was about to be stoned, the word of God says that the heavens opened and he saw the Lord because he was about to be martyred. And then what about Stephen's last words? for the Lord not to hold it against them. Now, we all want to hear that phrase from our Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. None of us here wants to just barely make it in by the skin of our teeth, okay? Um, that's what the, Peter is saying, that, that it's God's will that we all be welcomed triumphantly, but there will be some who make it in by the skin of their teeth, you know? So uh, Peter knew in verse 12, Peter knowing that his days were numbered, he wanted his readers to remember what he had written. Now, he uses that word remind four times. Okay, he uses it in verse 12, in verse 13, in verse 15, and in chapter 3, verse 1. Again, this is his second letter. It's his last letter. The guy's about to be taken out. So the purpose of this letter is to remind, 
Reminder to stay faithful. Reminder to stay strong. Reminder not to listen to false doctrine. It's a constant phrase that he uses throughout uh, 2 Peter. All right? Uh, he wasn't being critical of uh, his believers. He wasn't, being, he wasn't criticizing them. Instead, he was aware that they knew the truth and that they were established. What he wanted to do was remind them to stay that way, even after his death, which, which did come shortly after he wrote this letter. And of course, if you do these things, he says that, of course, your faith will be established. What was that Greek word again? When the Greek soldiers would stomp their feet into the ground? Stekos. Stand firm. If your faith, if you have these characteristics and you're trusting in the Lord, you will stand firm. You'll be established. The other Greek word is stekos, to stand fast and not, don't let yourself be moved by persecution, by discouragement, or by false doctrine. Now in verse 13, he says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. How'd you know? Wife. Yeah, he's my wife. He knows. He knows. Okay. All right. Um, he says, uh, Peter is reminding himself of his personal responsibility to keep presenting truth to the believers. Now, he uses the word tent. Now, in the King James, the word is tabernacle. But in the wilderness, what was the tabernacle, basically? It was a tent. And, of course, that tent, the presence of God was in the tabernacle. Now, it was still a tent. I mean, storms could come and blow it off. So uh, a double meaning is used in this, in this verse. A tent or a tabernacle is basically very fragile. Our bodies are very, very fragile. We're here today and gone tomorrow. But at the same time, our bodies are the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. All right? So basically he says that, um, that your body, is, I think the word tent is skenoma. In, in the King James, it's tabernacle. The physical body is a dwelling place of God's presence and the Holy Spirit. Whenever a believer's body, and anytime you see that phrase used, the word tent, it means something that's temporary and fragile, yeah. like our bodies as we serve the Lord. Right. But at the same time, if we're very fragile. Our bodies are also the temple of the Holy Spirit. Fragile, but sacred. All right? Now, he mentions a very interesting term. He says that it, he wants to stir you up. Now, this is a, very, this is a military term that was used in the Greek army. Um, when Greek soldiers were in enemy territory, they would sleep with their full body armor on with their swords by their side. So in case there was an attack, they could just jump up, grab their swords, and be fully dressed for battle. And so when an attack came, the Greek commander would yell out, the Jerian Humas. Um, stir up, wake up, wake up and get ready. That's what he would yell out. And of course, the soldiers would get up, they'd be in full armor, just pick up your sword and you're ready to fight. In that same way, Peter wants to stir us up. We're to be always ready, always on the alert. We're to keep our swords by our side. And what is the sword? The word of God. And our body armor, we all know we've read uh, uh, the epistle, the full armor of God. We're to keep the full armor of God on and we're to keep our swords by our side to stir us up. Okay. All right. All right. Now, verse 14, he mentions, as the Lord Christ has showed me. Let me just go over that. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Um, in the beginning of our video, there was a verse that was quoted uh, where it mentions that uh, John chapter 21, verses 18 through 19, where Jesus spoke to Peter and mentioned to him that his hands would be stretched out and he would be crucified. That could be what was being implied in this verse, okay? Uh, Peter's aware of his impending death. Uh, uh, how would Peter ensure that the believers continue? He had, Peter had two, basically two protégés, Silas and Mark. Sylvanius was his delivery man with the letters, but Silas and Mark were the, were the two believers he was mentoring, all right? And they would be counted on to continue his work after he died. Fifth and last one, the prophetic word, the faithful living, verses 16 through 21. We're going to read that quickly. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
And we heard his voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word cleverly devised. Now we're going to take verses 16, 17, and 18 together. Cleverly devised. Uh, the word is sophizo. Basically it came to mean someone who is a skilled liar. Uh, you could put together a lie. Not just any lie, but a good lie. Okay? It was used of someone who had skill. A painter. A potter. Sure. In this case, it was somebody who was skilled at lying. All right? And Peter is saying is, that's not me. It may be somebody else. It may be you. You're the false teachers, but I'm not the one who came up with these cleverly devised fables. Uh, the word is myothos, that is stories that are put together and circulated, and they're put together and circulated for the sake of deceiving people, like with the coronavirus, right? That's a, that's a whole different thing. Okay. All right. Um, basically, false teachers were saying that Peter and the apostles made up the story of Christ's miracles, his resurrection, and their return. And they were accusing uh, Peter and the apostles of doing this for power, for influence, and for wealth. A strange thing to accuse someone who's sitting in a cell, rotting, and about to be executed. Okay? Um, so that's what he was accused of. Now it mentions in verse 19 the prophetic word. Now this particular word doesn't refer to prediction. The word is propheticon. It means to foretell. It doesn't mean prophetess, a forth teller, basically to preach a message. I think I got that in reverse, okay? Uh, basically, uh, the, pro the prophetic word, the propheticon, an eyewitness account is strong, and the word of the prophets foretelling the birth, life, and death of Christ throws more weight of confirmation of the truth of the gospel. The propheticon was a foreteller. Now remember, when we read the book of Isaiah, there's a lot of mention about Christ He's going to be born of a virgin. In the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew quotes the Old Testament constantly. That was propheticon. It was foretelling. The prophets of old foretold the birth, life, and death of our Lord. All right? Um, it mentions light, okay? Let me just go over this very quickly. Verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which we do well to he as a light that shines in a dark place. Now, that word light is lanchano. It, it, what it means is basically a household lamp in the New Testament. They used to hold saucers and used to put oil in it with a wick. And that's what a lanchano, that's what's being referred to here. A lesser light, a lamp, okay, in a small sense. And they were used in the first century homes. The gospel message, both foretold and foretold, shines in a dark place. We're called to let our lights shine. Our lamps, in the Greek it's lamp. We're told to let our lamps shine. That's lesser. Who's the ultimate light? We are told to let our light shine, small l. In the Gospels, Jesus said he is the light of the world, capital L. All right? A smaller light represents the greater light, and the greater light will come at a later time. Uh, the Gospel message uh, shines in a dark world. But the day Christ's return is coming, in the daytime lamps are no longer needed. When the morning comes, now that particular word, morning star, in this verse, is the word phosphoros. Phosphoros, phosphoro. Yeah, phosphoro, yeah. That's the, Greek word, that's the Greek word for light, great light, phosphoros. It means light bringer, and it's only used in this verse in the entire New Testament. The same way a lamp, small l, our light, we're lamps, the same way a lamp is outshined by the morning light, Old Testament prophecy gives way to New Testament Fulfillment. The fulfillment is greater than the prophecy because the fulfillment is the, is the, is the coming through of the promise. Amen. All right? Verses 21, 20 through 21, and we're just about done. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, that particular word, private interpretation, is epileseos. It means to unpack. If you had a camel or a horse and you would take your belongings off and you would open up the, the sack, you were epileseos. You were unpacking your animal. 
all right? Now, it doesn't mean, that word private interpretation in the Greek doesn't mean to translate. Like we normally use it now, I'm, we're interpreting a verse, we're translating it. The word interpret in this sense means to, to preach, to tell, that sort of thing. It means to communicate. And in a nutshell, what this, these two verses are saying is that the Old Testament prophets did not speak of their own initiative. They didn't speak of their own desire. But these were holy men of God, and they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that word moved, in the King James, it says here, is genetai. All right? Uh, let me look at that last word here. Right, genetai. Uh, it means something that comes from, not from human origin, but from a divine source. So these holy men of God did not speak of their own will. Uh, these prophets did not say things that they wanted to say. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that word moved uh, is phenomenai, phenomenai. Where we get the word pheromone from. We all know what a pheromone is, right? Uh, animals that want to mate um, spray pheromones, and the pheromones compel other animals to come to them. It also came to mean the current of an ocean or a river. These holy men of God were moved. They were compelled. They were uh, driven by the power of the Holy Spirit to say what, they, what, what the Lord was telling them to say. And basically, again, uh, what Peter was saying in this entire first chapter is false doctrine, you have to stand firm against it. Uh, all these things, these are not cleverly devised fables. These aren't lies. I'm sitting here in a Roman cell about to be executed. And everything that you've heard and everything that I've said is divinely inspired. And it was said a long time ago. All right? I know I went very, very quickly. Are there any questions about anything I've said so far? We have like five or ten minutes. Any questions at all about anything? Yes, ma'am. Uh, by epileseos, E P I L, I think it's in there. Epileseos. It means to unpack. Mm -hmm. Right now, again, when we ordinarily we would think the word interpretation means to translate, to explain. In the Greek, the word epileseos means to communicate. So these Old Testament prophets did not speak their interpret their message. Their communication was of God. They didn't communicate what they wanted to say. The Holy Spirit moved them, compelled them, controlled them. The same way you and I as believers need to be compelled, controlled, and moved by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What does the Word of God say? The flesh counts for nothing. The Spirit gives life. Okay, any other questions? That word arete, doesn't that sound like jewelry? Arete? Like earring. Arete, earring? Arete, yeah. It's, well, I mean, it could, you know, again, it means something that's excellent, that stands out. I guess if you had a ring that was beautiful, I mean, I'm not showing anybody here. If you had a ring that was just absolutely gorgeous, it was arete. It stood out from anybody else's. So that word may, of course, arete is, uh, is the, it's the first characteristic that's mentioned. We're all supposed to have arete. We're all supposed to stand out. Again, at our jobs, we should have arete. At our communities, arete. In our families, arete. What was that? Life and godliness. Let me go back here. Uh, life and godliness. Uh, life and godliness. This was, uh, this was back in uh, part two, verses three through four. Uh, these were two phrases that were key in the Christian life. Life and godliness, uh, basically, um, dirote, uh, no, that wasn't it. The life and godliness, you mean that divine power and divine nature? Right after that, yeah. Right after that, yeah. The, the, the term life and godliness. Um, I, I don't think I gave a Greek translation for those two terms. I didn't give a good, uh, no, I didn't give that. But, but again, uh, the, the whole idea of having spiritual life and having a godly nature comes from, again, the, um, the divine power of God gives you the divine nature. Again, one segues into the other. Scripture is a unity. And one leads to the other. Uh, one verse doesn't stand up by itself. Everything in context, uh, like dominoes. Any other questions at all? Crystal clear, right? Okay. All right. I know I went very, very quickly.
Um, but again, I, um, I love Bible study. I love attending Bible study. And again, um, really, when you go to a church, uh, again, anybody can go to church. I mean, churches are packed on Sundays. But if you want to know what a church teaches, go to a Bible study. You'll know what the doctrine is, what the beliefs are. And you'll also know what your pastor knows. Of course, Bible study. I love Bible study, and I thank God for the Bible studies that are here as well. All right? Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be doing Chapter 2 next week. Amen. Haris Shalom to you all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. It is, it is actually a prayer of blessing, right? And it's, it's, it's why we take that term so serious here, uh, because we are literally releasing the blessing, the favor of God as a blessing onto your brothers. See, the world doesn't greet each other like that, but the brethren, the disciples of God, we greet each other in that, in that manner, grace and peace. Haris Shalom. I now know the name. Praise God. So that's good. Praise the Lord. Saints of God, we're going to re remind you that uh, we do have a little cake with some refreshments. Uh, if you want to take some pictures with Sister Leanne before you go, uh, that would be great if you could stay by just for a little bit, just to say so long. Not goodbye, but so long. We will see you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, are you guys freezing cold? Yeah. Ah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm good, too. Praise God. I actually turned up the heat a little bit, so it should be comfortable. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you glory and honor and praise, O oh Lord. We thank you for this wonderful teaching. We thank you for the Greek words, O oh God, and for the insight into Scripture, Lord God, from a, a whole different perspective. I thank you, Lord God, for Brother Allen. Continue to bless him and use him, Lord God, mightily. Uh, uh, Lord God, and we just pray now for the brethren. Once again, we lift up Leanne and her family, Lord God. Uh, Lord, give them safe traveling mercies. Bless them, enrich them, and allow us to serve them even from a distance in any way that we can, Lord God. Uh, we pray now for traveling mercies, Lord, for the food that we're about to eat or the refreshments, Lord. Bless it, Lord God, and uh, just allow us to have a great time of fellowship, Lord. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you at home. And uh, we'll see you again, God, God willing, Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. Remember, Friday night prayer. Hallelujah. Everybody's invited. <laughs>